Um, okay, so it's now five o'clock. And so, yeah, so welcome to the YE Big Meeting for this week. So this week, we will have Ricky Chong as a guest speaker, and he will be going over the an F equals MA preparation and strategy lecture. All right, hello everyone. Um, I think yeah, I think we'll start the lecture now. Okay. Hold on a second. Okay, so um, in this lecture, um, we'll be mostly doing a review of uh, some topics in the F equals MA, mostly going over topics that appear a lot and with the emphasis on topics that aren't really covered in depth in school of physics. And um, yeah, so, and uh, also we'll, we'll also go over some brief strategies um, here at the beginning before we get into the review of topics. Um, so, okay, so some brief, brief strategies from the F equals MA. Um, personally, I do not think there are that many strategies that are particularly useful for the F equals MA, like just all the normal test taking strategies apply. And I don't think there are that many other ones that are uh, specific strategies that are specifically good for F because MA, except for maybe, um, okay, well, one thing you want to do in the test is that you have to make sure to um, just, uh, what, okay, so one thing for the F because MA that I think is important, this is like the only strategy that I think is really, is, I mean, well, not, not really, but um, just one thing to keep in mind is that the F equals MA's problems are not really ordered by difficulty. So, um, so like most tests, the, the, the problems go from um, least difficult to most difficult. The F equals MA, the earlier problems do tend to be easier, but um, there are always like uh, difficult problems like scattered throughout the middle and it's not really a uh, rigorous. There's not really a rigorous like ordering of difficulty, so do not be afraid to skip around when taking the F equal MA test. Um, if there's a problem that you are really stuck on, just skip it. There's probably easier problems after it, and you can come back later if you have time. That's about the only strategy that I think. Yeah, so that's about the only strategy that I think is like pretty specific for the F equals MA. Um, our strategies are just like the normal test taking strategies um, that you use. So, so yeah, so for, for a strategy session, so for a strategy part, uh, I don't really have that much to say about it. So uh, just like solve the problems and don't be afraid to skip around. And um, yeah, just use normal test taking strategies. Okay, so now that we've got, so um, now, um, okay, let's just, now let's go through a review of some topics that uh, are in the F equals MA. Um, um, okay, so um, yeah, and okay, so forces, Okay, well, this is a pretty commonly ta taught topic in school, and it's a pretty big part of the F equals MA. So uh, we'll just go over like one forces problem, and we'll sort of talk about how you want to approach these problems. Because like, even because like for some of these problems, even if they might sometimes look really difficult, 
um, you, we just want to talk about like some strategies for these poems, since like they're pretty common for the equals I made. Uh, the most important thing to remember about forces, like problems with like forces and stuff, is that um, I think there's they they're not really that complex, even if they might look really complex. They're mostly just you can mostly just solve them by applying F equals M A. So um, so hold on. Oh, just a second. Okay, whatever. Basically, basically, the important thing to remember for these problems is just F equals MA. Um, just like what with these problems, a general strategy is to sort of like uh, find all the forces, draw a free body diagrams, and then um. And then use like F equals MA and other quantities that you know to write equations for these, um, <coughs> for for uh, to write equations, and then you can solve these equations. And if you do this, then you will get the correct result one hundred percent of the time. Uh, so like even if the diagram of the problem looks pretty difficult. Um, they, if you do this, then it can, then you can solve it. So, uh, for an example, let's look at this problem 12 from last year's F equals MA. I'll give everyone maybe two minutes to first look over it. And, um, if you've, if you've done it, if you've done it before, you can just, uh, know the solution. You can just like sort of review what you did. And if you haven't done it before, you can um, try solving it in the two minutes I will give you now, okay. Okay, so uh, now let's go over the solution to this problem. So, um, so this problem, there's an object with a mass of m equals one kilogram on a platform of mass m equals uh, four kilograms. Um, one second, and um, wait. yeah, okay, and uh, it's they're attached by a spring of spring constant k equals. 400 newtons per meter. There's no friction between object and platform and the coefficient of static friction between platform and the ground is mu equals 0.1. So the 
m is given an initial horizontal velocity v shown in the diagram and it asks for what v will the platform never slip on the ground well okay um well i didn't in, it, i didn't include the answer choices here but we're basically trying to find um the sort of the maximum v such that the platform will never uh slip on the ground um yeah okay so uh okay so how do we do this problem well um <clears throat> um let's see okay uh, how do we do this problem well we can just um we we can just like just use f equals ma so what does it mean for the platform never slipping on the ground that means that this big platform m relative to the ground will never have any um uh, will never have any acceleration so um okay so um yeah so um despite the spring force pull the spring pulling this object m uh it will never have any it will it will be small enough so that the maximum spring force will be unable to accelerate um m okay so um so if we write out so um since we're looking at the acceleration of big m well then it's good to use the equation f net equals m a on big m so if we look at the net force on big m well what are the forces there is the frictional for well there's the spring force uh since the spring is being stretched the spring force is is pulling uh big m um uh in, in that uh towards the right so the spring force, if the spring has been stretched the distance of x, then the spring force is, has a magnitude of kx. And uh, what other forces are there on M? Well, there's also the, sta the static, the frictional force from the ground uh, to big M. Let's call this Fs, the static frictional force. And uh, are there any force, other forces on M? there's like well there's also the gravity and normal forces but those are vertical and they also all cancel out so we don't care about those and these are the only horizontal forces and they are also the they are the only forces that will make m like slip relative to the ground so for f net we have that f that is equal to the spring force minus the static frictional force it is equal to ma since we are looking for a case where, where the platform never slips, then a equals zero. So this is just equal to zero. So we want kx minus fs to be equal to zero. And um, and um, we want kx minus fs to be equal to zero at all times. Um, so, okay. So, and we're sort of looking for, I think, the minimum horizontal velocity v such that... Um, this will always be equal to zero. So uh, for this to always be equal to zero, then, well, we could just look at when the spring is stretched at its maximum stretched. When it like when it's like stretched to the maximum length, then kx is maximum. And if if the accel if the uh, acceleration is still equal to zero, then then it will have to always be equal to zero. So what is the maximum uh, stretch stretch length of the spring? Well, we can just um, <coughs> do a conservation of energy on this small m. We initially give it an ener kinetic energy of one half mv squared, and um, and this is its total energy when the spring is stretched at a maximum then there's just the spring potential energy and uh no no kinetic energy so at the maximum stretch this one half mv squared is equal to one half k one half kx squared where x is the maximum stretch of the spring then we have that x is equal to uh to v uh square root um m over k so the v, v times uh, square root 
m over k is the maximum stretch of this spring. So uh, if we look at the case where this the spring has been stretched to its maximum, then uh, v square root, then we can just, um, then kx is equal to kv times square root m over k, and minus the static frictional force. And what is the static frictional force? Well, the static frictional force will range from zero to the maximum, which is uh, mu s times n. And uh, it will, and in that range, it will always be equal to like to whatever forces are pulling on this uh, object. So, um, so in order to find the minimum k, uh, well, minimum v, then obviously we want this to be so that it's just the static frictional force is just barely enough to keep this um, to keep this object from slipping at the maximum stretch. So that means that at the maximum stretch, the static frictional force has to be equal to its maximum, or it's just um, to be equal to the maximum. And the maximum static frictional force is mu s times n, uh, where n is the normal force. This has to be equal to zero. And then uh, what is n? Well, the normal force from the ground onto this platform n, for on this, this platform, has to balance out the gravity of the of the object above it. So that means n has to be equal to big M plus small m times g, since it has to balance out both the gravities of big M and small m. So then we have uh, this simplifies to k v times uh, square root m k uh, minus mu s times m plus m g equals zero. Then v the maximum v is equal to mu s m plus mg over square root mk. And then if we plug in these numbers, like the numbers here, we get that this is equal to 0 0.25 meters per second, I think. So for all v is uh, less than or equal to 0 0.25 meters per second, then um, or v is less than or equal to 0 0.25 meters per second then uh this platform will never slip okay so so any questions okay so basically for problems like this we basically want to just sort of find all the forces and apply f equals ma and uh just find these equations and solve them. These are pretty common sub problems, so we just went over one of them. Let's move on to some topics that aren't really covered in school, but are always appear on the F equals MA. Um, okay, so let's talk about propagation of uncertainties. Um, propagation of uncertainties, it's not taught in school, but like, in every F equals MA, there are always some problems on this topic. So what is what is this? Basically, in physics, when we do experiments, we have to take some measurements. Like, for example, we measure velocity and uh, time. But when we take um, measurements, there is always some error with our measurements. Like we can't know them exactly. So uh, then when we use these measurements to find some other quantity, like for example, if we take velocity and time and we want to find, um, say, the average acceleration, then we have to divide the velocity and the time. Then knowing the error in velocity and the error in time, we basically want to find what is our the error in the acceleration that we calculate from this. So that's just basically propagation of uncertainties. And um, yeah, okay, so with propagation of uncertainties, um, there are a few things to know. So uh, for, so, uh, okay, how do you, so um, usually we would write, so for example, if we have X, then we'd have like, that well basically um okay if we if we measure a quantity x and then suppose that the error then the error we usually call something like delta x then the measurement would be reported 
to uh, be of a value of x plus or minus delta x. So the actual value could be anywhere in this range. And um, yeah, so the delta x here is the absolute error of this uh, measurement. There's also relative error, which I believe is delta x over x, essentially just like the percent error, like uh, relative to, to the quantity. And um, yeah, so um, essentially, so some things to know about, um, <clears throat> about, so, okay. So, um, yeah, so, so, uh, so for example, in this prompt below X for this first part, the, the measurement is 1.013 seconds. This is X and 0 0.008 seconds is the error. So that's Delta X basically. Um, okay. So if we want, if we, if we have some measure quantities and we want to account, and then we make some calculations with these, um, measure quantities, um, if we want to find the error in those calculations, well, um, then there are a few things to know. Suppose that we add X and Y and, um, and suppose that, uh, like Z is equal to X plus Y or Z is equal to X minus Y, then the error in Z is equal to the square root of the error in x plus the error in y squared. So, uh, so if z is equal, so if basically if we have to, if if z equals x plus y or z equals x minus y, then uh, the error delta z is equal to square root delta x squared plus delta y squared. So, for example, if we like. Um, so for example, if we measure like so, like uh, the length of a piece of wood and we get that the length of this piece of wood is one plus or minus 0 0.1 meters. Um, and then we measure another piece of wood uh, and we find that this length is two plus or minus 0 0.2 meters squared. Then if we want, then if we like put these, the, these two pieces of wood together and we want to find the maximum, um, well, not, not the maximum, the error in this, uh, in these two pieces of wood added together, well, the, their length would be three, but the error in like adding these, putting these two pieces of wood like next to each other, the error of this length is just you add these two, um, add these two quantities. So this error will be 0 0.1 squared plus 0 0.2 squared. And um, yeah, and uh, this is like uh, something, square root 0 0.05. So um, yeah. So um, yeah, so that's basically, basically if you measure two quantities and you add them, then this is the error in their addition. On the other hand, if z is equal to x times y or z is equal to x divided by y, um, then the error in z is equal, well, okay, then to find the error in z, we have that delta z over z is equal to square root of delta x over x squared plus delta y over y squared. So, um, um, okay, so basically, so yeah, so if z equals x times y or z equals x divided by y, then this is true. So essentially, so basically, for example, if we have a rectangle and we want to find the area of this rectangle, so we measure the side lengths of this rectangle. Suppose we measure this side length to have a length of uh, three plus or minus 0 0.1 meters. And suppose we measure this side length to have a length of like three, uh, two plus or minus 0 0.05 meters. Wait, hold on. Then, um, well, we can find the area of this uh, rectangle. Um, and uh, we can also find the error in the 
if we multiply these quantities to find the error, the the area of this rectangle. Um, the error to find the error. Uh, suppose that the area is like a, then delta a over a is equal to square root delta x over x squared plus delta y over y squared. So um, the area here a is just three times two equals uh, six meters. Um, it's six meters squared. And then uh, here inside the delta x over x is just the 0 0.1 over three squared plus 0 0.05 over two squared. So um, yeah. So if we want to find the error in the area of this, um, of this rectangle, then uh, we just do this. And then we can solve for the um, error in the area. Okay. So if we know these, then we can like solve um, most of the F equals MA propagation of uncertainties problems. Are there any questions about like these two things about like this, this part? Any questions? Okay, so uh, let's look at an example here. It's from uh, an earlier F equals MA. So Alice and Bob are working on a lab report. Alice measures the a period of a, a pendulum to be 1.013 0 .01 plus or minus 0 0.008 seconds, while Bob independently measures the period to be 0 0.0, I mean 0 0.997 plus or minus 0 0.016. They can combine their measurements in several ways, and they ask for how the uncertainties of these are of these measurements are related. Um, uh, the basically, okay, let's just let's just find these uncertainties. Let's look at me method one. Keep Alice's result and ignore Bob's. The uncertainty here is just obviously zero point zero eight uh, seconds. Uh, for method two, average their results. Well, um. Suppose that the length, uh, suppose that um, Alice's measurement is x and Bob's measurement is y. Then if we average the two results, then we have to take x plus y divide by two. So then what is, so then the, so, um, so, so we know delta x and delta y, then what is the uncertainty of like, of this quantity well, the uncertainty of this quantity, uh, it's just the uncertainty of x plus y. This is a uh, square root of delta x squared plus delta y squared. Certainty of x plus y. And then uh, divide it. And then we have to divide by two since uh, we're averaging like, since, yeah, since like um, the this uncertainty is just, is the uncertainty of like this part divide by two. So uh, this is equal to, um, well, uh, Alice's uncertainty is 0 0.08 squared. Bob's uncertainty is 0 0.16 squared. And when we divide by two, uh, we add divide by two, we get that this is equal to like 0 0.089. Okay, so um, we'll look at method three. Perform a weighted average of Alice and Bob's result with Alice's result weighted four times more than Bob's. Uh, well, now here we are, now here given X and Y, we are trying to find, um, we are trying to find 4X plus Y divided by five since uh, when we do a weighted average, um, this is like 4X, it's a uh, 4X plus Y like divide by five. And then if we want to find this uncertainty, well, um, we have square root of four times delta x squared plus delta y squared. And square root of this divide by five. Note here that the four is inside the, um, uh, note here that the four is inside the um the the square the the square of the square because because um 
we because we are just multiplying we are just multiplying alice's result by four so um when we do this the uncertainty here gets multiplied by four and um yeah so the four is inside the square here because like this is essentially the new uncertainty of the, the uncertainty of alice's result times four so um yeah and um if for example instead we have alice perform her experiment four times then i think i believe the four would be uh would it would just be like delta x squared plus delta x squared uh four times so then in that case the four will be outside the square so anyway if we do this calculation this turns out to be 0 0.0072 so if we look at the rankings, we see that three is the lowest and uh, one is the highest. So the answer should be uh, the, wait, no, three is the lowest and two is the highest, sorry. So uh, the answer should be B. Okay, so are there any questions about this? Any questions? Okay. Um, Oh, yeah. On a side note, if we perform the same experiment n times and we average the n results, then the then the um uh then the uncertainty of this averaged results will be delta x divided by n because like if we perform this experiment n times and divide by n, then the uncertainty here would be delta x squared plus delta x squared n times divided by n so this is square root uh this should be square root n okay sorry um square root n times delta x squared i mean yeah divide by n so so basically um if we if we perform an experiment n times and we average the results of those n time experiments then um the the uncertainty of the average is the um, uncertainty of one experiment divided by square root n. Okay. Okay. Let's move on. Let's talk about fictitious forces, which I, which are also not taught in school, but they, they it also appears pretty frequently on the f equals m a. So it's very important to talk about them. Um, what are fictitious forces? Uh, basically, um, okay, so basically, when we have a, um, most of the time, uh, when we are doing, um, when we are doing physics, most of the time, it is in an inertial frame, so a frame that is not accelerating. However, if we are in, instead looking at an accelerating frame, then um, that F, then the F equals MA will not work in accelerating frames. Instead, we have to modify F equals MA by adding some terms, um, <coughs> by adding some terms um, here. So, um, okay. So we basically, if we are working in an accelerating frame, then we have to add some fictitious forces. Um, we have to add some fictitious forces. Um, like if, if, there, if we're looking at like something in an accelerating frame, we have to add some fictitious forces. So uh, what are, so there are four fictitious forces. Uh, let's first talk about the translational fictitious force. This, I think, is the simplest fictitious force. Um, oh yeah, suppose that we are work. Suppose that we are working in a frame that has a. Suppose that we def. Um, suppose that we are working working in a. F um, okay, yeah. So basically, suppose that we we are in a frame that ha is accelerating with an acceleration of a. So, um, so for example, if this is a car and it's accelerating with an acceleration of a, 
and you are a person inside the car, then you will feel a translational force that is of the value of negative ma. So for a person inside a car that is accelerating with an acceleration of a, then he will feel a force um, a force pulling him in the opposite direction of the car's acceleration. And the force will be of magnitude ma, his mass times the car's acceleration. So I think you can see this pretty often in real life. If you're in a car that's accelerating, you will feel like you're being pushed back in your seat. That's basically because of this. And um, yeah. And then uh, the next fictitious force. Um, okay, yeah. And we also have the centrifugal force. F centrifugal. Uh, this is equal to, uh, what is this? This has a magnitude. The centrifugal force has a magnitude of m omega squared r and is pointing uh, outward, radially outwards away from the center. So essentially consider a frame that is rotating with an angular velocity of omega and um, yeah, around, around this axis. And um, <clears throat> if we look at the, a person inside this uh, frame, uh, suppose a person is a distance of r from the, this axis, then the person here will feel a, cent a centrifugal force pulling him radially outwards away from the center. Um, yeah, and the magnitude of this force will be of, um, will, the magnitude of this force will be m omega squared r. So um, yeah, so, um, hmm. so basically this applies in the frame that is rotating. Um, yeah, you can also feel this in real life. So like, for example, if you are on a, one of those rides in, the, in an amusement park that is spinning, like a merry-go-round, uh, you will feel like you're being flung outwards. This is basically because of the centrifugal force. Okay, and third fictitious force we have is the Coriolis force. This is equal to uh, negative... 2m omega cr cross v. So basically, if we are in a reference frame that is spinning, or, or, um, that is spinning with an angular velocity of omega, and um, and we have like a person, the person is moving in this reference frame with a velocity v, and um, then this person will feel. A, um, a centrifugal force that has of the value of negative 2m omega cross v. So the magnitude will be like the magnitude of 2m omega cross v, and the direction will be basically determined by the direction of the vector that is like omega cross v and the negative of that. So for example, in this case, if we look at the, um, the angular velocity vector, vec the ve angular velocity vector from right hand rule is pointing out of the page and the person's vector velocity vector let's say it's just in this direction and if we try to find this um we see that uh there will be a coriolis force using right hand rule of magnitude 2m omega cross v um that's pointed in like this direction, pushing the person like in that direction. So uh, basically, if we are working in a rotating frame and we have an object that is moving with some velocity in the rotating in the rotating frame, then this um, object will um, uh, this object will will feel a. Um, will feel a, a, the Coriolis, will, will feel the Coriolis force. And also note that in the rotating frame, 
uh, object that is moving in a rotating frame will will feel will um, have both the centrifugal force and the Coriolis force act on it since yeah it's in the rotating frame basically. The last um, the last uh, what's it called the the last um, what's it called? fictitious force is the azimuthal force. It does uh, I'm not. Uh, I don't, it hasn't appeared in like F equal MA before, but it's good to know in case it appears this year. Uh, this is basically, uh, this is basic, this is like, um, this is, this is, this is pretty similar to the, uh, I, this is pretty similar to the translational force kind of so if you're in a frame that is rotating and not only is it rotating but the rotation is the, there is also an ang this frame also has an angular velocity then you then the an object will feel a um an azimuthal force that is dependent that is of the form of negative m d omega over dt cross r so like if it's a if if it's if from the origin to the object is um there is a vector r and um yeah and the 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 angular velocity of this of the frame is omega then uh yeah basically the the, the object will view an azimuthal force of negative d omega over dt cross r so yeah so basically when we are working in a reference frame that is accelerating, we can't just only use um, F equals MA. We have to add in these um, these fictitious forces. Hold on. Wait. We have to add in these fictitious forces. Essentially, in this case, MA will be equal to all the real forces on this object plus all the fictitious forces. Um, yeah. So basically, if we are working in a reference frame that is accelerating, if we want to do F equals MA on an object, then we have to, um, then, then, um we have to take all the real forces all the real forces will still exist in this uh, in this case we have to take all the real forces and then we have to add on these fictitious forces and this is the net f that we use in f equals ma okay so uh if we look at an example from uh last year's f equals ma we have alice and bethany stand side by side on the earth's equator if alice jumps directly upward her reference frame to a small height h, much less than a radius of the Earth, she will land a distance d to the west of Bethany. If Alice had instead jumped to a height of 2h, how far to the west of Bethany would she land? Neglect air resistance. Um, yeah. So since the Earth is spinning, we are in a rotating reference frame. And um, if we look at this rotating reference frame, there's a centrifugal force, which doesn't matter since it's directed outward, so it won't affect Alice's horizontal displacement. Um, well, all, the only way it will affect the horizontal displacement is just like by changing how much time it takes for it to land back. But like the centrifugal force of the Earth is pretty negligible compared to Earth's gravity. And, um, um uh yeah and since the alice is moving we, are, we have to consider the coriolis force and uh one thing to note is and yeah and basically this coriolis force it's perpendicular to alice's velocity and it will push alice to the uh west uh, to the west a distance of d so um the coriolis force is equal to negative 2m omega cross v um, at the equator, like if we look at Earth, uh, Earth is spinning west to east. 
So the um, angular velocity vector of the Earth will be pointed uh, through the North Pole. Then if we are on the equator and like we jump a little bit, then um, omega cross V will, will push Alice to the west. And um, yeah, and okay. So like if we want to find this, well, we can find the force on Alice and well, we can find Alice's acceleration due to this uh, force. So her acceleration is just negative two omega times v. The magnet, well, the magnitude of her acceleration is just two omega times v. And well, omega cross v, the magnitude of that is omega v sine theta. But here we are at the equator, so. Um, v and omega are perpendicular, so sine theta is equal to 1. So we just have 2 omega v, it's her acceleration. And um, yeah, and you can basically use this to find uh, v. Well, um, you can basically to find like what is d as a function of h. Um, first, since we note that her, that there, her velocity when going up there's always a point when going up where velocity, like well, the, her velocity when going up is like the same as her velocities when going down, like going up and going down are symmetrical. We can just look at when she is falling down um, and then find the distance travel when she is falling down n times two, because like in both cases, um, uh, yeah. So, um, um, yeah, so basically when she is, when Alice is falling down, um, her initial velocity is zero and, um, um, her velocity as a function of time will be negative GT. And if we look at the time it takes for her to fall down from a height of edge, then the time it takes, let's call it t0, is equal to square root 2h over g, since one half g t squared is equal to h. And um, yeah, so uh, if we look at her acceleration, her acceleration at a time t will be 2 omega times the, her, the acceleration from the Coriolis force at a time t will be equal to 2 omega times g t. And then, um, and then, um, um, yeah, and, and then, um, um, yeah, okay. And, um, well, we can find like her velocity and also the, um, the, then, okay. Uh, so, so this is her horizontal acceleration. Then her velocity after time t will be equal to v is will be equal to like uh, two omega g. Well, it will be equal to omega g t squared, and then the distance she will travel, the horizontal distance she will travel, will be equal to zero to two zero of or uh, to t zero of um, omega g times t squared times d t. And then if we integrate this, we get omega g t cube. Okay, whatever. Omega g times uh, t cubed over three from zero to two t zero. And we know that um, t zero is equal to square root two h over g. Uh, so this is this is equal to omega g over three times uh, two h over g to the uh, to the uh, three halves. And um, obviously our total distance, tra horizontal distance traveled is like this times two, since like she goes up and then falls down. And then essentially, and then now we see that if we increase her height to two H, then, uh, well, if H here becomes two H, then how much, by how much would D increase? Well, then we just have to multiply D with like, two to the three halves, right? Since H is like, 
since d is proportional to h to the three halves, so then d will be multiplied to two by like two to the three halves. So the answer here is d. Okay. So are there any questions about this problem? This problem just uses Coriolis force, and I've noted, and Coriolis force I think is pretty common amongst recent F equals MEs. Any questions about this problem? Okay. Okay, so um, class ends at six. So I think for Wolf, well, um, so I think for Kep force, like for some of these, I have problems here to talk about, but I think we'll just first try to go through the important things to know about these things. And we can talk about the problems later if we have time. So, um, Okay, so let's first talk about Clapper's laws. So F equals M A. Um, there are always a lot of problems about like um, orbits and stuff like that, where we have to use Kepler's laws to solve these problems. We only really need to know. We only really need to use three things when we are solving these problems. Um, so if we have an orbit one of uh we only really need three to use three things to solve these problems okay one first um is conservation of angular momentum angular momentum is conserved <laughs> this is kepler's second law um basically if and two with conservation of energy, energy is conserved. And okay, uh, not only, and also for energy conservation, suppose that we are in an elliptical orbit with a semi-major axis of length A, then the total energy of this orbit will, will be equal, the total energy of this orbit will be equal to negative gm um, over 2a okay so um so yeah so so basically in an so uh, so this is the total energy so if we say want to find the energy the the velocity of this object at a point of like um at some point in uh uh, if we want to find the velocity of uh, this object at some point in this orbit, then we can like take the total energy, negative of GMM over 2A, um, and we can subtract the gravitational potential energy, which if the distance from the object to the, to the planet is R, then the gravitational potential energy is negative GMM over uh, R. Um, then from that, that is the kinetic energy and uh, we can just find um, uh, the, the thing, the velocity. Uh, uh, import, um, an important thing to note uh, is that the uh, total energy is negative GMM over 2A. The gravitational potential energy is negative GMM over R. Do not forget the negative signs, okay? They're, they're, um, if you forget them, then I think you'll get it wrong. That, well, if you forget them, you'll get it wrong. So, um, so don't forget the negative signs. Um, yeah. So energy is conserved, angular momentum is conserved. And we also, and, uh, we also need to know um, Kepler's third law. So uh, what, okay, so Kepler's third law um basically states that uh well if basically if we have an orbit of <coughs> of of length of um semi-major axis a then the period of that orbit uh is related to a by t squared is equal to four pi squared times um a cubed divided by gm where m is the mass of the of the planet this object is orbiting ar around, uh, the m is the mass of like the the center of the orbit thing. So, um, so yeah. So t squared equals four pi squared a cubed over g m, and um, yeah, that's just Kepler's third law. 
And um, yeah, so when we're solving like problems with orbital mo motions, we only really need to use these three things. You, you can just use these three things and um, basically write some equations and you should, and you will be able to solve the problem 100% of the time, okay? Um, yeah. So, so for, so for this problem down here, I don't think we'll have time to go over it. So we'll skip it for now. But basically, um, for this problem, you don't need conservation of angular momentum, I think. Uh, you can just use like T, the Kepler's third law to find, um, to find uh, the, the change in semi, the, the new semi-major axis of the second satellite after, after changing the orbit. And then from that, you can, um, since you have the new semi-major axis, you know the new total energy, and you also know the original total energy, and then you can basically use this change to find the change in uh, velocity, okay? So I'll leave 20, this for you to solve. It was problem 24 from last year's F equals MA, so you can find the solution by yourself. Okay, so um, dimension analysis, I think you guys are all familiar with that so we won't go over it too much center of mass um just the center of mass just know that the coordinates x is equal to like uh the sum of all m divide like all m times x divide by the total mass and uh uh, remember the if that we have a system with no external force, then the center of the if we have a system with no external force, then the center of mass will not um will like will have a of this system will sort of have a constant speed. Like for example, the uh, classic problem if we have a two masses of small m and big m glued together and uh, we set off an explosive charge between them. And then after a certain time, what is after, suppose after a certain time, the distance between them is D, then like, what was the problem? Uh, then like sort of uh, how far maybe has each object moved? Basically the center of mass of the object has not changed is still the original center of mass and um yeah so the small m has moved a distance of uh m bit of since the uh, um and you basically just like find like where the center of mass of this of this new system is relative to m and big m and the center of mass has to coincide with the original center of mass okay so for moment of inertia, we all know like the definition of moment of inertia is r squared times dm. Won't really go over the basics. Um, it's obviously we, you. It's good to know the um, like the moment of inertia of like so all the basic objects, like for example a disc or a sphere or um, a solid sphere, a hollow sphere, or like a a loop. And for those, you can just you can you can find a list of these moments of inertia just like online or something. So um, uh, so and uh, two theorems for moment of inertia that we have to go over. One is parallel axis theorem. Uh, basically, if we have an object, suppose this is the center of mass of the object, and this is some other point. Uh, and we pivot the object around this point and we want to find the moment of inertia of this object around this point. Suppose that the, this distance uh, between these two points, the center of mass and this point is R. And then the moment of inertia of this object, let's call it point A, around point A, um, or actually let's call it point P. Uh, the moment of inertia of this object around point P will be, um, uh this the the this will be equal to um the the moment of inertia around the center of mass plus m uh suppose that the mass of the object is m m times r squared so um 
yeah so um hmm. yeah so I, I i'm sure you all know what parallel access theorem is so basically if we want to find the moment of inertia uh, oh yeah um uh the, the these are of course moment of inertias around axes that are through these points and like parallel to each other uh i think uh one thing that i think some students probably forget is that moment of inertia is calculated around axes not points since things rotate around axes since like i think um a lot of times when we calculate moment of inertia and like these rotations they're around uh planar objects so then we don't really care about axes in that case since all the axes are like through the through some point and like perpendicular to this plane but if we have an object that is not planar that is 3d then like we have to make sure that like for example like if we have an object the, if we are trying to calculate the moment of inertia of this object for um, like some axis here, the um, moment of inertia, um, when we're doing integral of r squared dm, if we look at small mass here, suppose this is dm, then r squared in this case is the distance from dm to this axis, to the line. Uh, not to like some point on the line. Like if this axis passes through the center of mass, it is not the r is not the is not the the distance to the center of mass. It is to this distance to the axis. Moment of inertia is calculated around axes. Okay. Uh, second moment of inertia theorem to uh, remember is perpendicular axis theorem. It's not as useful as parallel axis theorem, but like on the last few F equals MAs, there have been uh, problems involving this theorem. Basically, perpendicular axis theorem states that, um, <clears throat> well, first of all, the perpendicular axis theorem only holds planar objects. So if we have a planar object, so it's a plane, and suppose that it this plane this object is in the x y plane, so um, x y are two axes that are um, that are in the plane of this object, and um, and uh, yeah, so uh, this so um, yeah. And then suppose we have a third axis z that 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 um, uh third axis z that suppose it's like that is perpendicular to x and y so like this axis z that's like passing through here as perpendicular to x and y it's like coming out of the page then the moment of inertia of our, of this object around z is equal to the moment of inertia of this ar object around x plus the moment of inertia of this object around y okay so um yeah this only applies to plane objects and um yeah it, it's like it, it's a peer to peer for on the f equals me so i have so remember this so i i z equals i x plus i y so for example uh suppose that we have a disk with mass m and radius r and um we are asked to find the mom the the moment of inertia of this disk around this uh, around an axis passing through the center of mass of this disk, but and is in the plane of this object. Um, now, um, now for when it comes to center of mass, most of us know that the center of mass. I mean, that's not center of mass. When it comes to moment of inertia, most of us know that the um, we all know that the that the that for a disk the moment of inertia around an axis that is perpendicular to the plane of the disk is equal to uh one half m r squared but now we have to find um the center the moment of inertia around an axis that is um uh, that is inside the plane of this disk and passes through the cm uh, how do we do this well, we can just use perpendicular axis theorem. We can actually, we can like, so for this disk, 
Let's this is the same. And um, we can draw two of these axes, X and Y. Well, X and Y, the two of these two perpendicular axes, they're both in the plane of the disk. And we know that the moment of iner if inertia of these two axes are equal because, um, well, it's a disk, so it's like symmetric. Then we know that the sum of the moments of inertia around these two axes, uh, Ix plus Iy, is equal to the moment of inertia um, of an axis that's to the center of this disk and is and is perpendicular to the plane of the disk is Iz. Well, now we can find Ix since Ix and Iy are equal. We have two Ix is equal to Iz, which, as we all know, is one half m r squared. Then we see that Ix is equal to one fourth m r squared. So basically, the moment of inertia of uh, an object through a uh, through a uh, an axis that is in the plane of the disk um, and is passes through the CM is one fourth m r squared. Okay, so are there any questions about this part? Any questions? Okay, um, yeah. Okay, so now we are a bit over time and I have covered most of, mostly most of what I, I was going to cover. Um, for rolling, for rolling, um, I, I think we are all familiar with like rolling with and without slipping. So I won't really go into this. All of these problems are from recent F equals MAs. Like uh, this problem is from last year's. This problem is also from last year's. The, the they are all for these are all from last year's problems. So you can look them up and just like do last year's F equals MA. Okay. So um, since we are over time, I think um, uh, the lecture is over now. Uh, thank you for listening and uh, good luck on the F equals MA. Well, okay, so thank you for coming and I hope you have a nice rest of your weekend.